Good morning. It's my privilege to welcome everybody to this event, and I wish that you do feel welcome as uh, we are gathered from several countries and to celebrate the church. Uh, behind me, you see the uh, banner that says, Church, why bother? And on your bulletin, you'll see the verse that is there is Proverbs 27 verse 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And so when we ask the question, church, why bother? Then we ask ourselves, well, if we see somebody chopping with a machete, why do you think he bothers to stop and sharpen the machete? It gets the job done right. And so why do we bother? And so as leadership, we have been gathering since Friday, Friday nights, where we considered... Let, let us, how we draw near to God. Saturday morning we talked about holding fast to the hope that we have. And then Saturday after lunch, stir up love and good deeds. And then last night we had, let us assemble. And this morning we want to consider how we can encourage one another. So I want to welcome you once again as we, as we make our way to the chairs and as you sit down. I hope you do feel welcome. I want to say a huge thank you to Spanish Lookout. I'm not going to start naming names because I most likely will forget somebody, but I, I know that this took a lot of work, a lot of effort, and so I want to say thank you to Spanish Lookout. So if you could help me say thank you with a, a round of applause. It was just fabulous. We've had beautiful hosting. Everybody had a place to stay. We had a place to worship at the church uh, till now. Now this whole thing has been set up. I know that the hosting and the logistics committee and, and the food committee, the music committee, there's just so many people got involved with this and we just want to say thank you. It's, uh, thank you just hardly seems to do it justice, but I think we'll leave it at that for now. And so one day we hope we can repay it. And some of you that just got here this morning, well, you probably said, well, uh, we just got here. I'm not sure if, what to clap for. Well, you know what? You clapped, and I know that by the end of the day, you'll be glad that you clapped. And so, thank you, Spanish Lookout. I have a few announcements. I'll call on Henry Radicup and Albert Reimer to come up. They have a few announcements to make as well. The children will be dismissed. There will be, an, uh, there will be a change to your agenda. If you will look at the back page of your bulletin as today's program, there will be a slight change on there. The choir will be singing right after worship and singing. So if some of you need to uh, take care of your children, uh, you thought it would be further along the program, that's going to, the choir is coming up after worship and singing. That is a change that's in the program. And this is so that some of the people that are ministering to the children uh, also have the opportunity to sing in the choir and hear the choir. And so children that are 4 to 10 years old will be dismissed. I will call, I'll say when they will be dismissed. So it's a, a 4 to 10 or 11 year olds will be going to the church on that bus that's there. And so if your child is not quite 4 but he has, you say, well, why couldn't he go with the 3, uh, with the 4 year olds? It's the parents' decision. It's not a hard, fast rule that it's four or that it's ten, but the parents get to decide whether if they want to send their kid along with the bus to have activities at the church. And so I will tell you when that is supposed to happen. And then later on we'll dismiss the one to three year olds who will be staying right here at the park. At 2 p.m. After lunch, uh, Belize Camping Experience, Alexander and Leah will be having a program for the children, so that's going to be right here at the park at 2 p.m. For those of you that have been driving around Spanish Lookout, you drove here, you've been driving around, and now you're saying, well, my tank is too empty to get to Belmont or to get home. Midway gas, will, Midway Convenience Store will sell you gas. Uh, they will be open between 4 and 5 this afternoon. If you have planned to leave sooner than that and 4 and 5 just doesn't do it, call Walter Thiessen. And if you need his number, I have his number, so call Walter Thiessen. If you need to leave before, before 4 and 5, then they can still help you, but then you just need to call them ahead of time. For the Blue Creek EMMC Church Council tomorrow night at 7.30, the youth meet at the park on Wednesday at 7.30. That's youth and young adults will be playing Mission Impossible at the park on Wednesday night. 
and for the junior youth Friday in the church basement at 7.30. Good morning, everyone. Um, on behalf of the Spanish Regal EMMC, it's a great pleasure to um, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, hearty welcome and thank you to the Shipyard uh, Congregation for coming out, uh, for the Blue Creek Congregation to make the effort to drive over here. Um, also, uh, thank you very much to the uh, conference leaders to make the effort and come down and have the uh, council meeting down here. Thank you. We've enjoyed having you so far and we're enjoying uh, visiting with you some more. I also want to thank the the musicians for their effort on this event. Uh, also on behalf of our church, our ushers, thank you for the extremely hard work setting this all up. And the food committee has already worked extremely hard and also uh, is preparing to continue today. Thank you very much um, for the activities leader this afternoon. We thank you for um, your effort. Uh, the hosting committee has done an excellent job in putting this all together. And, not, uh, and also the children's committee for taking care of the kids. It's been really wonderful so far and for it, uh, undertaking that today. And uh, to the Spanish Agal EMMC Church, uh, you should have all received a little p paper with some announcements for this coming week. Uh, if you don't have, the ushers asked it for, from the ushers. The announcements are that everyone is invited to an evening service with Al Kaler on Thursday, 7.30 p.m. this coming week, November 20. And also the ladies will have a ladies committee, um, a ladies meeting with Lynn Harms on Wednesday. That's on Wednesday, 2.15 p.m. at the church, November 19. And they'll also be having the annual ladies committee elections. Thank you. Just as a little bit of an icebreaker, I will quickly do, uh, I want to, people, if you get ready to stand up, because most of you will be, sta all of you will be standing at some point in time. I'll make this quick. Uh, those people who are here from Saskatchewan, could you please stand? Okay, welcome here. Thank you. You may be seated. How about? Yes, and uh, the general council is here with us today, and so they, they come from Saskatchewan. How about next? Uh, Alberta. Okay. Thank you. Manitoba. <laughs> Welcome. Ontario. Welcome. Anybody else from different Canadian provinces that I did not mention? Okay, how about anybody here from the U.S.? Stand up. There you go. April Oliver, teacher in Blue Creek. Okay, Mexico. Anybody here from Mexico? Colonia del Valle, Opal Chain. Okay. Blue Creek. Welcome. Shipyard. Welcome here this morning. Spanish Lookout. Thank you. Welcome here. It's good to see you. So our hats are off to Spanish Lookout. So we'll be kind to you. You're more of you than a... Anyway. Yes. And so it's good to see you. Did I miss any group? Anybody that I did not mention, please stand up and I'll... Uh, oh, Belize City. Yes. Yes, and so if I forget people, I have to do special announcements, right? And so thank you, Alexander and Leah, for being here. You'll run the children's program this afternoon. Much appreciated. Anybody else I forgot? Indian Creek. We have visitors from Indian Creek. Okay, and so we have... Welcome here. And so if, there's, if there is some of you that I forgot, it's not intentional, it's, it's an oversight. And so if you're here from whatever country you are, we, we welcome you here this morning. And so I'll ask the, uh, the worship team to take it away. Testing, testing. So we will start with a song, Großer Gott, wir loben dich. The first verse in, in German, Testing. and then we sing verse 2, 3, and 4 in English. Uh, and then after that is How Great Thou Art. I'd like you to stand up for the first two songs. 
Uh, we have a quartet up here supporting all four parts, and then we have the brass. So I would encourage you, if you sing different parts, alto, tenor, or bass, just sing whatever you desire to sing.
I hope you're okay with another German song, Freund wird ziehen ins Heimatland. I would challenge those that sing high in the chorus to sing the Descant. Not everybody, please. ask you to stand again for the next two songs.
thank you very much to the orchestra for for singing for us or for playing for us and for the worship team for singing. There was a lot of effort put into that. We thank you for that. At this time, I'd call on the choir to please make your way up here to uh, lead us in, or to present some songs. And I want to take a special time to say thank you to Ed and Wilma Taves for getting this all organized. I know they spent many hours in, in uh, travel to uh, facilitate this. They organized the choir that's from Blue Creek Shipyard and Spanish Lookout. And so the shipyard would come to Blue Creek to practice. And so we thank you for all the, the time and gas and energy that took to come and practice. We thank uh, Ed and Wilma for being willing to drive all the way to Spanish Lookout on a number of occasions to get ready for this choir. And for these, I thank all the members of the choir for taking time out of your busy lives to come and, and practice over and over so that you can present this morning. So God bless you as you serve.
Thank you very much. That was very beautiful. I want to say thank you again for, for setting all of that up. Lots of hours and lots of practice. Thank you very much. At this time, we will dismiss the children. So the, uh, the four to ten-year-olds, if you could make your way to the bus, and you'll be bussed off to the church where there is a program for you, and people will be taking care of you at the church. So four to ten-year-olds, if you could make your way to the bus. Uh, Brother Abe, could I call you up here to end the PowerPoint to, or for... Oh, you're doing it yourself? Okay. You're setting it up? Okay. And the children of ages one to three, if you could just stay with your parents yet, once the four to ten year olds, once the bus leaves, if the one, uh, then we will dismiss the one to three year olds, just so that we don't get a mix up back there. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, right? So we have time for children. Judging want, by where they're going, Jesus must be somewhere else. <laughs> omnipresent, right? Well, brother, they go into the church. Okay, so once again, uh, once the bus leaves, then the, the one to th if you then you can send your one to three year olds to the back there, and they'll be taken care of right here uh, on site. They have babysitters avail available. So once the bus leaves, then uh, the one to three year olds you can bring them to the back, and they will take care of them. And so now we'll give the time over to Abe Giesbrecht. He is the EMMC Go Mission Missions Facilitator. And uh, I have known uh, Brother Abe for a long time, and, and for those of you that come from Blue Creek, you will know his uncle, Pete Giesbrecht, and I think Jake Giesbrecht, your uncle, yes. was a teacher at the school at some time, so uh, he has family that was serving here, and I've, I've known Abe personally for uh, quite a while. He's been to Blue Creek several times, and he's now the missions facilitator, and I think he's doing a wonderful job connecting missionaries uh, to the office and also connecting the office to the missionaries, and not only that, but the region, informing the regions of where the missionaries are and connecting regions to the missionaries. And so I want to thank you on behalf of uh, the Region 6 and the conference for the great work that you do, Brother Abe. And so thank you. Thank you. It's uh, just a, a privilege and an honor to be here. And uh, Winnipeg's a lot colder than this is, so. But, no, truly, um, singing. Uh, Lil and I weren't quiet up front. We were singing long. And it's curious that we, my family was in Paraguay for, for years, uh, well, for a number of years, years ago. And it so happened that Ed was the choir director I sang in then. So I'm looking forward to an invitation to join the choir later when they sing again. Thank you, Region 6, for the invitation, for the opportunity to be here, for your support as, as a, a group of churches that obviously believes in missions, and uh, for the organizing committee, the, uh, the people who have put this together. What an amount of work to get this going. So I will try and, and help you understand a little bit of what, what, like the sign says, doing together what we can't do alone, what we are doing. And it's, it's a glimpse of what is happening. And I welcome, I'll, I plan to be here for the afternoon and uh, for the evening. So if you have questions, you know, let's sit down over uh, a cup of coffee or ice cream or just a chat and and I'll try and give you a little more information of what what your commitment to missions as a region and as us as a conference what that is doing I, I know that that uh, in reading a little bit of history in, of the EMMC your name in in Blue Creek especially comes up very quickly as missions minded it wasn't long after you asked for some help for some of some of the church leadership for some teaching and training that you were looking past your community and past your borders to help reach others and now as you uh, you work together as churches you are reaching past borders and you're reaching into the inner city of Belize I, I see Alex and Leah here I see Leah here I don't know where Alex is he doesn't sit still long enough to to th sit through a program like this, but they're here, and, and a large part of the success of what they're doing is because of what you do. You and the other Mennonite communities here 
caring for the kids of your land for that next generation who will build up this country. And as you teach and train those kids, they will bring biblical principles with them in some ways that your land may have never have known before. So continue in your missions outreach. Now on to the commercial. No, it's not a commercial. It is information on what we are doing. The Rinaveda, separated from the Zomafelda in 1937-ish. And one of the primary reasons was there was a feeling that we needed to reach out. The mission's emphasis, and it wasn't long after that, that the first missionaries were sent out to Africa. And that was a little different than you now sending people to Belize City or even, you know, Canada sending missionaries to Bolivia. Then they didn't know if they were coming back. They didn't know if their letters home were going to get there. Now it's a little different. We, you know, FaceTime and we Skype and we chat and we email. So we have that contact. But first with different agencies, the emphasis was how do we reach people? Later on, there was a self-administered missions board. Board of Missions and Service, whatever it was called, was organized to see where can we as a group of churches help others. And now both many of the churches, you here, many of the other regions' churches have ministries that are locally church administered or that you as a church sponsor or support or in some ways man with people from your churches. And there are people that go out with EMMC Go Mission and I'll introduce a new couple just in a few minutes. And then there are many that go with other agencies as associate missionaries to many different countries of the world. Again, doing together what we can't do alone. And as we look at the, at the future, I will show you just glimpses of, of the opportunities that there are. And so if you feel God nudging you, don't ignore that. Don't stifle the spirit, both as a blessing for you and as a blessing for others. Let, let God do his work in and through you. Today's presentation, I'll touch a little bit on Liab. Liab is La Iglesia Evangelica and Bautista in Bolivia. That is the conference that resulted from our work in Bolivia. And they continue to be partners with us uh, in, in some of the ministry work in amazing ways. Mission Evangelica Menonita is our Bolivian work, the low German work that we do with the low German Mennonite communities there. There's Steinreich Bible School. I'll talk, talk a little bit about that. Hope Mission, which is just sort of down the road uh, between here and Veracruz somewhere. And Diedrich Dick and myself plan to head there next week to, uh, to visit with John and Maria Wall as they uh, reach out to the indigenous communities, the small churches that are there trying to form uh, strength, strengthen the pastors and strengthen the churches there. The Alberta Outreach, Vauxhall, we've heard a lot about that. I'll say just a few words and show a picture about that. The Low German Translation work that's going on, and then some of the opportunities that are there. So, first of all, Liab. That's the group of Liab leaders. Um, some of you maybe recognize a face or two there. The guy in the orange shirt at the uh, top right-hand corner is Ruben Mercado. Ruben was the missionary sent by the Liab churches to Mexico City for about eight years. He and his family lived in Mexico City, planting churches, strengthening churches, working with alliances, uh, in large part uh, a network of evangelical Latin or Spanish churches was formed uh, with uh, Ruben's help and leadership. RIMI, the organization, has uh, contacts in a number of Central and uh, South American countries, and they are uh, a resourcing group to strengthen each other as pastors. Uh, the guy in the white t-shirt in the back row is Oscar. Oscar is the director of La Fortaleza School, and uh, the next slide has a little bit of information uh, about uh, La Fortaleza. I'll talk a little bit about that. The guy sitting in the front, the, in the middle, is Natali. He runs the Training by extension, we have the Seon program and, and Hilda Friesen is doing some translation into Plautich, so some of you may know of her material. 
This same material is available in Spanish, and Naptali runs SETA, uh, the organization that distributes this material in Bolivia. And at any given time, they have between three and 400 people studying in, in, in very, very structured ways, studying, in this case, the life of Christ, and then other uh, courses also. So Lieb continues to be strong, but continues to, like we, be involved with people. And people are not perfect. And so even uh, just earlier, uh, two days ago, uh, I had a, an email from Ruben asking for help and prayer, saying we have some, some, some problems. They also have some opportunities, but, but they are people like we are. Pray for them. That is La Fortaleza. At the, the bottom right hand is a classroom. That is one of, these students are sitting in a classroom that we helped construct with the offering that we took at the Relay event in Winkler a couple of years ago. Then the campus of La Fortaleza School and Church is that is the inside the green line. At the far right-hand side is La, the La Fortaleza Church. As you go down toward the left, uh, that little roof building is what used to be the clinic. Sharon Soper and other missionaries did a lot of medical work in the clinic. That building, the clinic is now closed down because of the advances in the, the government-sponsored medical facilities as they get closer to the area where La Fortaleza is. Then uh, the um, uh, yellow rectangle, that is where this classroom building is. Uh, it's a, the, the second story is what we helped put on. And there's an empty classroom there that's waiting for 30 computers. So if some of you would be interested in supplying 30 computers or two or five or 16, talk to me later. And then the two red uh, parts are the expansion projects. This school now has over 800 students in Spanish. Those students are graduating and going to university and becoming professionals. Aurelia, one of the pastors, has one daughter who is in her last year of medical medicine to be a doctor and another son who is in training in university to be, become a, uh, a, a computer engineer. So this, this group that we started with back in the 80s is becoming, they, they were the poor and the lower class now. And their leaders say, we have to do church differently because we are now working with professionals. And these people are turning into leaders in the country. The, the classroom building, the design engineer for the classroom building and the project manager for the construction of that were former graduates of La Fortaleza. In a, in a wonderful twist, graduates of this school went to teacher's college, and there are many teachers around the country that studied here, but ironically, several of them are teaching in our Plautich school in Villanueva. So we start a ministry working with the Spanish people, and God says, I can use that. He uses it to help us minister to the low German people from the German communities. Wonderful way in which God works. The two red um, spots are planned expansions. They, in the top part of it, there is a sort of a shiny building and then another small building. Two small buildings that are hardly larger than your uh, living room house 110 kindergarten kids. I'm just glad I'm not a teacher there. But he sa Oscar says, we could have 250 kids if we had the facilities in kindergarten. So you know where that leads in the next years. So their plan now is to put up a two-story, five, five classrooms on each story, kindergarten building, so that in the future, potentially, they can house 250 kindergarten kids. But that's going to take more classroom space. So the L at the bottom is proposed academic administration classroom space a three-story L-shaped building that will allow their population of students to go up to a potential of 1,500 kids. And they, Oscar is confident that he can fill the building because people are asking for quality education and they know when they send kids to La Fortaleza they get, they get not just one and one is two, they also get 
information about the God who made it so that one and one is always two. It's not a flecht von der Obermari nech. It's always a message about the truth is what they come out with also. So they have five buses, six buses that bring kids from different areas of, of Santa Cruz into this school. Ironically, you'll notice right down in front of the building, just sort of behind the picture of the classroom, is the town square. Latin America always has a town square in a, in a city. And virtually always there's a Catholic church on the town square, but not in La Fortaleza. There's an evangelical church and a school right on the edge of the square. The uh, John and Anita Bandman, when they, they worked with EMMC years ago, that was one of their, their aims to, to be a light in the community. So they're reaching out past their own community. These are two of the church plants. The bottom left hand uh, is the Barrio Israel, which is on the suburbs of Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz is growing very quickly, and so they have moved out from where La Fortaleza is, and um, this uh, is, is a church where the pastor is standing, Jorge, I think he, his name is Abe, is that Jorge? Abe and Betty Ann know them, that's Jorge. Uh, he's standing under what is now the roof of their, their fellowship building, that's their church building, that's where they meet. And when they have the funds, they will put walls around that and that will be the pastorate, and they will build a church to the left on an open lot there. And it's also right next to the square in this Vario Israel, the, the community of Israel. Then Tarija, which is um, a city toward the, the south of Bolivia. Dave and Lisa Jansen are, are honeymooning there right now. They, they took a couple of days off and just, Dave and Lisa took off and are in, in Tarija as we speak. Uh, but that is a church plant in Tarija with the hopes of not just planting a church there, but reaching past into the department of Tarija and then across the borders into Argentina and possibly to, uh, to the east into Paraguay. Although Ed and Wilma and I know that there isn't very much in that area of Paraguay until you get to the Mennonite colonies, of course. But, but that, their hope, they are reaching past where they are. Uh, just uh, to give you a, a sort of a sense of, of where we're at, the red arrow is pointing to Santa Cruz, and the green arrow in the sort of bottom right hand, the green arrow is pointing to the area of our sort of the newest ministry we have out of San Jose, the town of San Jose, and then to Nueva Esperanza to the north of that. So that's where we work with the Mennonite colonies. But this is talking about the Spanish Liab ministries who are reaching out to past uh, their churches. There's about a dozen churches, depending on which week you talk to them, there's about 12 churches, and then they are also looking past, training their leaders, and uh, uh, working at reaching out past their borders. Now this is in San Jose. I know you can't hear that. That's the people we work with in Nueva Esperanza. That's Bill uh, Kaler Allen's brother. Two years ago, two and a half years ago when I was there, we went up this man's driveway in the dark. And the buggy started coming in the dark up to have a meeting. In the dark, and you know the significance of that. We Canadians don't understand that. But it was so that their neighbors, the people's neighbors wouldn't know where they were going, and that Peter's neighbors wouldn't know who was coming. Now, they've got a school building. They've got actually three school buildings and a teacher age on that yard, and this is their school building and, and this, the uh, uh, church building. And this is held any time. They have school there all day and stuff, so that, that has, there's been a lot of change in those two years since uh, I was there first. And that is... Some of that is based on this. This is our low German outreach to people who request help. There are many ministries that work in Bolivia, many different mission philosophies on how to best help the low German 
Mennonite people there. There's an estimated 70 to 80,000 low German Mennonites in 70 to 80 colonies, some of them large, some of them small. Our philosophy is to work as a team helping people who ask us for help. There's enough work for, for the other mich missions and ministries doing their philosophy. We feel we want to limit ourselves to help those where we can, help those who request our help. It's us as an EMMC with partners. The La Crete Church, the La Crete Berkteller Church, is uh, an equal partner in the MEM work. So any missionaries that either of our mission or their mission sends are equally funded and the administration and infrastructure is equally funded by us as EMMC Go Mission and by them as Berktaler. More recently, in the last couple of years, we have, we have invited the EMC to come alongside. The EMC is not in that way a financial partner, but they are a partner in that they provide workers when we have needs and as they have workers available and finances available under our administration and under our team leadership. A, a novel partnership that is, is at this point working, working well together and, uh, and reaching people. We do that under a vision of evangelism, education, and economic development. Three phases or three parts. There's so much work you have to sort of limit what your aim and your goal and your, your, your strategy to help or strategy to pull alongside to, of these people is. And we work with evangelism, education, and economic development. And we try and, and be flexible and not nail them down and say it always has to be in this order. But generally, that is the way it is working. So here's our staff. Dave and Lisa Jansen. They're from uh, La Crete originally. They've been in Bolivia about 16 years. He is the field director, and they are coming back to Canada next year. They have tendered their resignation and plan to be in Winkler sometime May or June of next year. They, they are a, a strong asset and have, have really helped give perspective to the colonies, perspective to how the government feels about the colonies and things. So Dave will be missed. But this isn't Dave's work, and it's not our work. It's God's work. We want to cooperate with him, and he knows what he's doing. So... Dave and Lisa will come to Canada, and we want to bless them in their endeavors with their family as they set up home in Canada. They're not Canadians anymore. So they will need some becoming Canadian again and getting used to the cold and Tim Horton's coffee and some of those other things. Arlie and Eva Peters. Arlie is sort of the director of education. They're from the Aylmer Church. Arlie has been instrumental in allowing those schools that we operate there to be recognized by the government so that anyone who writes a test, any student who writes a test, any graduate who graduates from those schools, the, the schools that Arlie works with, they are recognized by the Bolivian government. Their certificates, their grades, their uh, diplomas are all recognized. The first school committed to the low German Mennonite people that is recognized by the Bolivian government. And there are other schools operating under that umbrella so that Arlie is sort of the director of education for these. There's over 300 students from low German communities now attending this school. They teach in English, Spanish, and Plautich, and they teach from a Christian perspective because socialist Eva Morales, the president, said these people have a cultural heritage. They deserve to get to know it. And what's our cultural heritage? Plautich and Christianity. So in his roundabout way, God is working and saying, yes, you can teach Christianity to these kids. Yes, you can teach in Plautich, which they understand. Wonderful. And Arlie, pray for him. He's very busy. He is still the principal at the Villanueva School, but there are a number of groups and colonies on hold waiting for Arlie's attention and help to help them start schools. And Arlie can only do so much. So pray that he would also know his limits with his family, with Eva, and, and their situation. Uh, Simon and Edith Peters are from, also from La Crete. They work with outreach and counseling. And right now, one of their, their primary ministries is reaching into the colony of Belize, which is a little bit uh, east of Pylone. 
and they go there basically weekly for meetings and then also meet with other, uh, co- uh, other people during the week. They are also counseling people who come out of the Guia de Paz Addictions Treatment Center. So that is a, a, a hard work, working with these, in some cases, poor, wrecked people. And that is only a, a transformational work that God can do. And so pray for our, uh, Simon and Edith as they work with that. Ileana Fair has sort of a Belize connection. Some of you may know her. Uh, I think Blue Creek is, uh, has been her home at one point. She's from the Leamington Church and is a short-term teacher at Villanueva. John and Helen Fraser, the pastor couple, they are an EMC couple who were in, I think, Pelly, Saskatchewan, and EMC offered or invited them to consider being pastor couple in Villanueva. Wonderful people, quiet, gentle, but also stern and direct. But uh, people that, that that community needs. Bill and Martha Kaler, you can maybe see the resemblance to Al. Well, it's not very... He's in real life. He's a little darker than that, but um, he is the pastor and sort of outreach couple. He and Martha in San Jose, in that new area, into the colony of Nueva Esperanza, a colony of about four thousand to forty-five hundred people. And as I understand, they used to live in Blue Creek. Many of them are people who moved out of Blue Creek when when that transformational revival started in in Blue Creek. They are now people that are asking us. Some of them are now asking us for help. And uh, Bill and Martha have done a lot of groundwork in in helping Peter Banman and his family, helping the school get started, helping regular meetings to get started, and doing leadership training there. Henry and Carolyn Cron are also in San Jose. They are a ministry um, ministry center couple. They are the host couple there. They make meals they, to keep the place clean. And Denver, are you here, Denver Coop? Hi, Denver. Good to meet you. Uh, you guys sent Denver on a work team uh, a couple of years ago. He, he would know what this place looks like, and some of the Canadians who are here have been to this place also. But Henry and Caroline provide a, a place of refuge for people coming off the colony, a, a, a straw roof to sit under and drink some cold uh, water or tarare, and uh, also good meals and a low German resource center that they, they work with. And they also travel regularly into the colonies to, to help there. Our newest couple, just approved by the board meeting uh, a couple of days ago, Abe and Margaret Harder. He was uh, I, sort of something like the pastor of German ministries or congregational ministries at the Aylmer Church. They have just been approved and are planning to head to Bolivia in uh, sometime maybe April of next year. So, so pray for those changes as they, as a couple, prepare themselves for what it means to leave their family here, reach out and go where God has called them. It, it's not something that people do just, oh, well, you know, you wake up one morning and say, I think I'll go to Bolivia for a couple of years. It, it's a, a serious consideration for them. So pray for them. And pray for the leadership changes. As Dave may, moves off the field, Dave Jansen, we haven't had a lineup of people wanting to be the field director in Bolivia. So without applications, even those shoulders that we've tapped, we are now planning to move Bill and Martha Kaler from San Jose into Santa Cruz to take on some of that field director leadership. And then Abe and Margaret would take over some, at least some of the responsibilities and work that Bill and Martha were doing in, uh, in uh, San Jose area with the Nueva Esperanza colony. Villanueva, some of you have heard about Villanueva and the community there and the school. That's the school. Over 150 students. And like I said before, some of the teachers in this school are from the La Fortaleza. They've gone through the La Fortaleza uh, school system. That's the Villanueva church, inside and out. Villanueva, as some of you know, has had its growing pains over the years. But I've seen even the last couple of years the, the maturing of the people who live there and sort of a, a, a contentedness in their spirit of living there and living off the colony. Because moving off the colony is not an easy thing for them. So how do you do that well and how do we help them well? But uh, the, the church is growing and they are excited. This is the ministry center in uh, uh, San Jose. 
It is uh, a very comfortable place to stay. So if you want to go on a short term, Ed and Wilma and others, if you want to go on a short term to help ministry in Bolivia and you go to the San Jose area, this is where you'd be staying. Air-conditioned suites. And if you go as a work team and you have like 10 guys or so, you'll sleep in the same room and you'll snore at different levels and different uh, uh, sounds. Uh, it's an interesting situation. But you'll get good food and you'll get a rewarding experience with the ministry that is going on there. That's the uh, host couple house. So if uh, once Henry and Carolyn come back to Canada and you want to live in Bolivia and be uh, working with that ministry, that's uh, the house you might live in. I don't think uh, Henry would leave his motorcycle there. but uh, And then our, our attempt at helping the local people. You know better than I do or than we Canadians know what it means to be excommunicated out of a, out of a colony. There are so many things that you lose or that you give up or that, that change for you. And one of them is the economics. So here is uh, Peter Reimer making cheese. And you don't become an expert cheesemaker. Those of us from uh, Manitoba, we know Bothwell cheese is sort of the cheese that you go after. His cheese is not Bothwell cheese. But he is working at it. And that's a, a, a start at economic development. There are also other opportunities, other uh, plans in economic development. So ask me about those and ask how you can be involved, and uh, we'll try and put you in touch with those. This is the uh, Unidad Educativa Brillante, the school at Nueva Esperanza, our school. 30 students and three teachers. A couple, a Spanish couple who was sent by their church in Cochabamba to be missionaries to the Mennonite kids in Nueva Esperanza. That church took them on as missionaries to teach in our school. And the pastors and some of the people from the church have visited them for encouragement. And then we have the Coctemoc Blumenau Church who is sponsoring uh, a teacher there uh, for the Low German and English studies. The lady to the far right of this picture is the Canadian ambassador to Bolivia and Peru who came and said, I've heard about what you guys are doing and I want to see it. She was impressed. And the local school officials are impressed. After our, during the first year of education in that school, the local school director or minister of education for the San Jose and region came and saw it and, and said to Bill after as, he was, as she was leaving, she said, I wish all our Spanish schools in Bolivia were as good as yours here. That's after the first year. So we know there are others that want to attend the school, so pray that we would be wise in what we do. That's the schoolyard, the uh, portable structures, portable buildings that used to be part of the Villanueva school have now been moved out to Nueva Esperanza and are now part of this, uh, this school system there. And there are the teachers. Then some of the staff needs. Just to throw this in to get you thinking, school principal in Villanueva, economic development coordinator in San Jose. There are large opportunities there. An outreach couple for Belize Colony and short-term teaching staff in uh, San Jose. And uh, also we would also always welcome other short-term teaching staff teaching in English to these kids in those colonies. Then off to Mexico, Steinreich. Steinreich Bible School, I'd heard a lot about it, had never been there till earlier this year. This past se teaching season, which goes from January to March, they had over 300 students taking all or part of their program of studies in Plautich. And we, there were, I met a couple of couples from Paraguay who said, Do I ask China on the shows on us yet? There is no other school like this where we could go to school. We don't have the academics to go to SEMTA or to EVA or whatever they have in Paraguay and other schools. They wouldn't let us in because we don't have the training, the, the elementary school training. But we can come here and study. And there were pe people from Paraguay, Bolivia, uh, Mexico, Belize, Southern Ontario, La Crete, other areas of uh, Canada, states, and Mexico. A very valuable facility. And... Our brother, Diedrich Harms, is a very valued member of the faculty and staff and promoting director and, and procurer of stuff. 
he, he is really a, a very valued person there. And I know you know Diedrich here from having been here a number of times this year already to, to uh, work and, and uh, work with you on, on some of the uh, uh, ministry situations you have here. So pray for Diedrich that he would also know when to slow down. They fly into home and then they get in their van or they do some laundry overnight and then they get in their van and then Judy drives while Diedrich sleeps in the back on a mattress and then Diedrich drives while Judy sleeps in the mattress in the back so they don't have to stop on their way to Manitoba or wherever they're going next. Pray that he would be wise in using the strength and energy and wisdom that God gives him. Very valued counselor for many people too. John and Maria Wall in Oyapan, that they're from the Aylmer Church. John is from the Aylmer Church, and we as, as a mission support some of their work. And uh, Diedrich and I plan to meet with them uh, over next weekend to, to talk over some of the opportunities that there might be for us as a conference to, to get more involved in that ministry to, the, to not just the Spanish speakers, but also to the indigenous Indian groups in the area around there. So uh, a valuable ministry also. And that's where Oyapan is. It's, it's somewhat south of Veracruz, and uh, you are almost straight east of there and a little, little south in Belize. So pray, pray for Diedrich and I as we travel next uh, week that when we meet with John that we would also be sensitive to his needs and to how we can best and, and, and most most effectively work together in his, his feeling of God's calling to meet the spiritual needs of people in the area. Uh, it may be that John drives a Ford pickup, but when I was there visiting, we had to leave the truck at one place, and then we just walked from there. I don't know if a Chevy would have made a difference, but, but the roads are such that at some point he just parks it and then he walks. And there's a picture of one of the churches. Then off to Vauxhall, southern Alberta. Again, uh, estimates of close to 20,000 low German Mennonites in southern Alberta. And spilling over into southwestern Saskatchewan. Lots of opportunity for outreach. And, and Alan Kaler can tell you this story much better than I can, or, or Isaac. I will just show you the picture of the new Vauxhall church and the uh, Ben and... Uh, Tina Fraze, who are working with the Vauxhall Church, they have just recently agreed to uh, extend a term, so they will be there, Lord willing, for another couple of years. And then uh, Isaac, who is here somewhere, there he is, Isaac, who is working with the Newell Church just in Duchess, which is just north of Brooks, also in that area. Uh, so uh, they would uh, covet your visits and prayers as they uh, do their ministry there. And is that the end of the needs? No. The Plot Teacher Bible. A lot of people said, why are we translating this Low German Bible? Everybody knows either Spanish or High German or English or something. But when you sit in a circle with some of these men from these colonies, grown men sitting there looking at, at these words and sort of sounding them out, and then they look up and say, Dort sagt die Bibel? They've been through the old colony church system. Didn't understand it because it was in high German. Then they get it in low German. And all of a sudden, ah, oh, that's what the Bible says. So we are also working. We're blessed to have uh, Hilda Friesen. Uh, her husband, Wilbert, used to be a pastor in the Winkler Church. Hilda is doing a lot of work in a basement office in her house. Three to four days a week she spends down there translating from English into Plautich. And she just uh, uh, emailed us about a week and a half ago saying, this is book three here. She, she finished that earlier this year. She said, I've got book four almost ready for the printers, and I hope to have hard copies before Christmas. She's, she's committed to this. So um, if you get a chance to see her somewhere, thank her for her commitment. And then are there other opportunities? Oh, yes. In Plautich? In different countries? Yes. I don't think you have to even go far from here to find opportunities in Plautich. Spanish, yes, Mexico, potential of Cuba, some other areas, possible ministries with AIMM. Uh, uh, we used to be a full member with people, missionaries in Africa. We have a, an association with them, so if there's someone who, who feels God leading them to a ministry in Africa, talk to us about AIMM. 
people groups in your area, and you are doing that here. I saw a little bit of the, the surrounding community uh, in, in my time here, and I've uh, heard a little bit about Blue Creek and, and Shipyard and the ministry that's stretching beyond colony borders. Continue to do that. And thank you for your continued support. I don't think there's time for questions right now, questions and answers, but I will be around. Collar me and twist my arm, and I will, I will try and help you understand a little bit more of what we are doing together, what we could not do, do uh, alone, and may God guide us to be faithful in this ministry of reaching out. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Brother Abe, for giving us a scope of the missions of the EMLC Go Mission. At this time, I'll call on the orchestra to come up and get ready to play while we do the offering. I'll get, ask the ushers to get ready for the offering. Not the orchestra, just the small group. Okay, the small group. The, the group that's uh, been asked to play while the offering is being taken. And so the offering, if the ushers could get ready, the offering will go 50% of the, the funds collected this morning will go to... Uh, EMC Go Mission directly into uh, helping with uh, some of the mission that you just saw, um, 50% or not not exceeding 7,000 Canadian, 25% will go to uh, regional uh, mission and uh, mid regional uh, needs, and 25% will be used for uh, covering the expenses of this gathering. And of course, if if 25% covers more than the uh, uh, the expense of this gathering, it will be used in the regional uh, mission and regional needs. And so we thank you in advance for the, the offering that you're going to take, and we ask that you give generously so that we can help some of this work that is ongoing in EMC mission. And so before we take the offering, let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you are a God who cares about people and you want to care for those people through us. And I thank you for the report that we just heard, that people are on the move and working and we can get involved. Bless us as we give from the abundance that you have given us. In Jesus Christ, amen. So if you could uh, take the offering. God bless you.
Thank you for your gifts. May the Lord bless you for them. And so I'll call on Pastor Dale Dirksen to make his way up here. He is going to do the theme presentation today. And uh, he is going to talk to us this morning about let us encourage one another. Pastor Dale comes from uh, the Southland uh, Evangelical Church in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Uh, he serves as the EMMC moderator, and so I have worked together with this fellow for a number of years. And, uh, and he, if you look at the word moderator or facilitator up in the dictionary, you'll see his picture beside it. Uh, he does it well. And so uh, I, I praise the Lord that we have found a facilitator in, or a moderator in our conference who cares that much about conference and one of the things I appreciate very much about him is he's he continually reminds us that guys we need to pray about this because if God is not in this then we're just uh, sitting around the table talking about stuff take it away Dale thank you John I uh, get the privilege of both speaking about encouragement today but before I do that I want to just uh, tell you about a few examples I've already experienced thank you for the encouragement from Spanish Lookout in Region 6 for what you've done in inviting us to this gathering. Uh, Norma Reimer handling the registrations. Ben Friesen picking us up in the airport. Um, Joe cleaning up after the meals. On the f I don't know who else is on the food committee. He's, he tells me about Brangus cattle I never heard about before, so I'm going to call him Brangus Joe. I don't know if that's his name, but that's how I'll keep him straight. But he's just a servant and working so hard. And all of you guys, for your encouragement, you have, you have been a great encouragement to our council. I also would like Walter Thiessen to make his way up here. Walter Thiessen has been part of our council for about eight years and has recently stepped off. Yeah, you know where you are, Walter. Uh, so I want to give you a little gift from the board and council because you have been such an encourager to me during the time that I have been on this. Walter has such a gift of encouragement, such a servant heart. I didn't get you a very big gift because Lisa took most of my space for candy for the school. So. Uh, you just get a little CD and the, the biggest chocolate bar I could find. So, God bless you, Walter. Thank you. I also want to uh, just say thank you to um, the um, church at Spanish Lookout. Um, just bring up that next picture if you can. I know you won't be able to see this very well. Uh, that's a picture of uh, my daughter Lisa and my two granddaughters. Uh, Lisa's nieces, who she's now living with. I I'm going to skip to this mic, the one with the red. Okay, uh, Lisa was a teacher here for the last school year, and because of your allowing her to teach and the kids that she worked with and your encouragement for her, she's now in university studying to become a teacher in Canada. So she couldn't come today with me or this weekend because she's got exams and assignments. So you have encouraged her and uh, guided her on that career path. So thank you, Spanish Lookout Church, for the work that you've done in my daughter's life. It's an amazing to see the, uh, the encouragement. And I've been asked to speak about encouragement. Our text is Hebrews 10.25. Let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, throughout the weekend, we've had different ones talk about, encur uh, talk about the uh, words of Hebrews, the let us, let us draw near to God, let us hold on to our hope, let us love and stimulate unto love and good deeds. And yesterday evening, let us assemble together. And those messages are going to go onto our web page. And I encourage you to listen to them because that's the foundation that I'm going to build on today about encouragement. All of that stuff, understanding who we are in Christ, the hope that we have, the, the gift that Jesus gave us on the cross, give us the capacity and the motivation to encourage. One of my most faithful encouragers was my mother. And I suppose that's not a unique thing to have a mother who's an encourager, but uh, I have thought about this more recently because my mom passed away at the end of June. And uh, she um, has been such a great encouragement to me in my lifetime and in my ministry, and I, I really miss her. But I, I often think of her because of, of the way that she's impacted my life. And, and I come from a family of 12, so I can't quite keep up with Henry, who has like 18, comes from a family of 18, but it's a pretty large family. And the, and the one time mom, my mom was working at camp and one of the other camp workers asked her, how do you keep track of 12 children? Like, that must be quite a household to manage. She goes, my kids are great. I wouldn't take a million dollars for one of my kids, but I wouldn't give 10 cents for another one. So she had a good way with words, and uh, so I appreciated that she wouldn't sell me. 
um, and because I was one of the last ones. Uh, but she also had a she also had a saying about encouragement, and her view of encouragement was this. She says encouragement is like money; it never comes at a bad time. And I don't know if that's original with her, but that's something I've always remembered. Uh, I don't know about you, but usually when people hand you money, you take it, right? It's it's a good thing, and that's what encouragement is. It's it's appropriate. It's welcome, it's helpful, it's necessary. And I want to dig into a little bit, what does the scriptures say about encouragement? I want to just give us a few biblical examples of encouragement to leave with you. And I don't know if you can see that screen, if you will be able to uh, follow along on the points, but uh, I'll just leave you with five things easy to remember. The first kind of encouragement we find in the Bible is support. And that's taking an interest in people, investing in them, and showing that you care. When someone takes an interest in our lives, it is tremendously encouraging. And there's lots of scriptural examples of this happening. In Genesis 26, Isaac is, has a big family. He's got a, a lot of flocks and herds and all these people to take care of. And Abimelech says, you know what, you're, 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 you've grown too large. We can't live on the same land. You've got to move away. So Isaac moves away and he digs a well, which I can't imagine is an easy thing to do. And he settles down. And some people come and say, no, no, we're, we're, that's our well. And they push him away. And he digs another well. And some more people come and say, no, no, we're using that well. You can't have this place. And he goes to a third place, uh, Girar, and he digs another well. And finally they leave him alone. And he says, oh, I have space. I have peace. I can finally provide for my family. And it says that night in Genesis 26, it says, that night the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and increase your number, the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Isaac's on the run. He's frustrated. He's trying to provide for his family. He's trying to be responsible, and he's always getting these, these hassles. And then God shows up and says, Isaac, I care about you. I'm with you. I'll take care of you. I'll watch over you. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. And he, it's a great example of support. In the New Testament, Jesus does the same thing with his disciples. He, he sends them out in Matthew 10. And he says, when you go out there, you're going to face opposition. People aren't going to like what you say. People aren't going to accept your message. And you're going to be rejected. And it's going to be, it's going to be difficult. But he says, remember, God cares about you. And he says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall, fall to the ground outside your father's care. Even the very hairs of your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I've been watching this little bird fly in and out of here. You know, meaningless, really, in the scope of all creation, that little bird. But God says, not one of those falls that I don't know about. So don't be afraid. You're worth way more than that. I'll take care of you. If you're my disciple, I'll watch over you. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Take courage. I'm with you. God often steps in to encourage. But sometimes God says, you know what? I want you to be the encourager. I want you to be my hands and feet. I want you to minister to that other person. I want you to give them the support that they need. That's when, when it, we have to step in and say, and be the hands and feet of Jesus and say, I care about what happens to you. You're valuable. You're important. And that we take the time to um, show those examples of encouragement when we invest in people's lives it could be as simple as sending someone a card and expressing your care it could be saying can i pray for you can i just uh lift you to god right now and and, and encourage you that way it could be just uh, a reminder of you know you're doing a good job i, I really appreciate what you're doing and, and you've ministered to me and just and just allow god to use you let's look for ways to support let's look for ways to invest in other people that's the first one. Secondly, inspiration. Inspiring people. What you did to Lisa. To give courage, to build qualities, to celebrate success. You know, the word courage is in the word encouragement. To give courage to someone, to inspire them to become more than they are now. What would we be if someone hadn't believed in us and inspired us? Jesus did this repeatedly with his disciples. When they're crossing the lake and he walks to them on the water and they're terrified because they think there's a ghost or some apparition on the water, he says, don't be afraid, take courage, it is I. Take courage, I'm with you. 
You can do this. When Paul's in his ministry, Paul was told when he started his ministry, you're going to suffer, Paul. You're going to have a lot of difficulty in your ministry. It's going to be hard. And everywhere Paul went, he got beat up or he started a riot or, or they uh, ushered him out of town or whatever it was. He was always in trouble, it seemed. So finally he comes back to Jerusalem near the end of Acts. And in Acts 23, he wants to speak to the Jews and he, st he starts to tell them about the gospel. And he starts another riot and the, and the army commander takes him into the barracks to save his life because they're going to kill him. They're going to rip him apart. And while he's sitting in the barracks, locked up, the Lord appears to him. Acts 23, 11. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in, Ju in Jerusalem, so you will also testify in Rome. Paul, I'm with you. Paul, I see what's happening. Paul, I care about you. Fulfill your mission. Take courage. And he, he inspires him on. We look at the great things the apostles were able to do. That's because they were inspired. You can do it, God said to them. To focus and build on the positives rather than to be destroy people by criticism. To celebrate successes and to push people forward. It's so important. We do this as parents all the time. You put your kid's picture on your fridge, even though you can't recognize that thing. They tell you what it is, but it looks nothing like that. But you proudly display it on your fridge and you say, go for it, kid. Get another one. Maybe next time it'll actually look like a dog. I don't know, but, you know, keep it up. Keep trying. I, I remember uh, Lisa was part of your worship team at Spanish Lookout. And I remember some of the first piano recitals that uh, I had with my daughters. Their piano teacher is actually here. Her uh, husband is on our council. And I remember the first recital I went to. There was like, it was two teachers, so there was like 45 kids that were going to play at this recital, and there was like 60 items on the program. And maybe I'm exaggerating slightly, Debbie, but I don't think so. It was a long program. I thought, I said to Cheryl, we're going to be here for hours. We got to listen to 60 piano pieces and like grade pre-beginner? Like, this is torture. Thankfully, they're only about 30 seconds long, so it really doesn't take that long. But I went to every piano recital because I wanted my girls to know, I believe in you. I wanted to inspire them. Yeah, keep it up. Someday you won't just play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Someday you'll play something in a church and you'll play music to praise God. And they do. They both play on, on worship teams in our church. And that's because uh, they were inspired to continue on. And, and we can do that for each other. Who in your life needs to be inspired? Who in your life do you need to come alongside and say, I believe in you. You can do this. Don't give up. Take courage. Third part of encouragement. Supporting, inspiring, and also empowering. Training somebody. Providing opportunities to correct or to guide. Probably the best biblical example of this is Barnabas. Barnabas' name actually means son of encouragement. And Barnabas was a great example of how to empower others. Barna well, when Paul became a believer, Paul was a persecutor of the church, and when he became a believer, the apostles were scared of him. So Barnabas said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and take him under my wing. So Barnabas went and met with Paul. He brought him to the apostles and said, he's safe, guys. I can vouch for him. And, and he brought him in, and they started to talk together. And then later in Acts, Bar Bar uh, Barnabas and Paul go on a missionary journey together. And Paul... Um, is trained by Barnabas how to speak and how to minister to people and, and how to encourage people. And, and uh, Barnabas takes him under his wing. And Barnabas is the leader. And, and if you look at the book of Acts, it says Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Paul. And then it starts saying Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas. All of a sudden, Barnabas has trained him and empowered him. And Paul's starting to take the leadership. And Paul's starting to do more of the speaking. And Paul's starting to do more of the ministry. And, and Barnabas kind of... Uh, steps back and allows Paul to take leadership. In fact, in, in Lystra, in Acts 14, they do a miracle and the people want to worship them as gods and they call Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. That's, I guess, the god who speaks. And so Paul is already recognized as the one who's doing most of the talking and that's because Barnabas empowered him to do that. Then in Acts 15, they want to go on a second journey, and, and Al talked about this yesterday, but they have a dispute. 
Barnabas wants to take Mark along, but Mark quit during the first journey, and Paul doesn't want anything to do with them. So they, they go their separate ways. And Barnabas takes Mark, and, and they go to Cyprus, and they start their own little journey. And Paul goes off with Silas. And then we, we fast forward about 20 years to the end of 2 Timothy. This is just about the last words that Paul wrote when he was alive. And uh, he says this in, verse four, in chapter 4, verse 11. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. When Paul's at the end of his life, when he's desperate and alone and he needs help, who does he ask for? For Mark. Why is Mark available? Because Barnabas didn't give up on him. Because Barnabas said there's potential in Mark. And Barnabas worked with him and he empowered him and he brought him along so that one day, 20 years later, Paul had no use for him at the time, but one day, 20 years later, when Paul needed him, Mark was there because Barnabas was empowering him and training him and mentoring him. Maybe there's a Mark that you can empower and encourage. Maybe there's another Christian who's feeling defeated and discouraged that you can restore. Maybe instead of doing all the work yourself, you need to just take another person with you and show them and, and train them how to serve and minister. Empowering. Fourthly, another part of encouragement is accountability. Giving perspective and confronting. This is the aspect of encouragement that's a little bit tougher. But our theme verse is Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. What happens when iron sharpens iron? What happens when you take that knife and you rub it across that steel? It produces friction, doesn't it? It produces heat. It's not easy. Sometimes relationships become that way. They're, there's friction. They're, they're difficult. Or we have to say things that are, that are tougher. But when my perspective becomes clouded, I need somebody who will help me see clearer. When my attitude stinks, I need somebody who will tell me so that I can ask for forgiveness. And we need to respect each other uh, well enough to step in and hold each other accountable. And sometimes in the, the most helpful encouragement we can give another person is a rebuke. These two ideas are often together in Scripture. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2 says, Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with, with great patience and careful instruction. Rebuke and encourage are linked together. Then Titus 2.15, These then are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Again, those two parts linked. Part of encouragement is rebuke. Twice we have those concepts linked in these verses. We tend to associate a rebuke with discouragement, but it might be the most loving thing we can do at times. We've talked a lot this week about sports analogies, and I'm a Riders fan. That's a football team in Saskatchewan. And we might have some other fans here today. There's some people from Manitoba might cheer for Winnipeg, but they're out of the playoffs, so that doesn't matter. Uh, we might have some Ontario people that will be cheering for Hamilton during the playoffs, but probably not very many. Uh, we even have a few people from Walter's Twisted Family that cheer for the Stampeders. I don't get that, but... <laughs> Some other Alberta roots here. Okay, well, maybe that's okay. But when I watch a game and I'm cheering for my team, I admit I'm biased. I see a play and I think that's a penalty. Come on, ref. Do something. That's not fair. Now, another person who doesn't cheer for the Riders will say, no, that's exactly what should have happened. And we won't agree because I don't see things clearly. I'm biased. I'm, I'm pro one team, so I want that team to be treated well. And so I understand that. I have blinders on because of my perspective. And you know, all of us have that in life. We are all blind to certain things. We don't see things as clearly as we should. Maybe we took something personally that wasn't meant to be a slight. Maybe we're passionate about something and we're, we're bothered that somebody else isn't as passionate about it. Maybe we don't appreciate somebody else's perspective when they're just trying to give us a bigger picture. Or maybe, and, and I probably this won't happen, but most of you probably have a strong German heritage. Maybe we're just plain stubborn. 
and you know we're, we're wrong, and we know we're wrong, but we don't want anybody to tell us we're wrong. Could that possibly happen to someone with a strong German character? I think it might. We have blind spots. We need accountability. We need someone to love us enough to hold us accountable and give us a rebuke from time to time. Are we willing to hold people accountable? That's the fourth way to encourage. And then finally, encouragement might be warning. At the end of this verse it says, encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The day referred to here is the second coming of Jesus. Jesus came the first time to teach us about God, to, to show us our sin and to help us to understand his grace. To understand that our sin separates us from a holy God. Because I have that stubborn sinful nature, I cannot be in the presence of a holy God. And that my faith alone in Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross is sufficient to save me. There's nothing good that I can do to earn God's favor. It can only come when I accept Jesus' finished work on the cross. His death on my behalf, his substitution is why I can be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, whoever trusts in him alone for salvation can have eternal life and will not perish. And then the next verse says this, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The reason Jesus came the first time was to save us, to seek and to save that which was lost. But the Bible says Jesus is coming again. And this second coming, this day, referred to in Hebrews, will be as a judge, not as a savior. This day will be to bring a, a sword to the earth and to decide, are you with me, are you in, or are you out? And we need to warn people that this day is coming. That's why we do what Abe talked about. That's why we have EMMC missions. So we can go and tell people that Jesus is coming back and you need to get ready. That's what drives us as a family of churches to evangelize. In Titus, the characteristics of an elder are listed. And in verse 9 it says, An elder must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. This trustworthy message of the gospel is what we must hold to. This message of salvation in Jesus is the key. It's the only way to God. We must hold to it and we must warn people and refute those who oppose it. Sometimes the most encouraging thing we can do is warn people of impending danger. This day is coming. Jesus will return. We need to warn people to be ready. In John 14, Jesus told his disciples about his death, and he says, I'm going away, but you know where I'm going. And Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way there? And Jesus said, Thomas, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one can get to the Father except through me. I'm the answer. Jesus said, I am the only way to God. If you repent of your sin and place your faith in him, you can be saved, the Bible says. So take warning. He is coming back. You must be ready. You know, I'm not, I'm not a hellfire preacher, but I need to be honest with the word of God. And when the word of God says we need to be ready, when the word of God says take warning, we need to take that seriously. Because the, the Bible doesn't tell us a lot of details about hell, but it tells us it'll be a place of torment and, and weeping, and darkness but I think the the greatest problem or, or difficulty in hell is that you're eternally alone if you if you want to say to God I want nothing to do with you during my lifetime he will say okay you can have that in fact you can have that for all eternity that's what hell is it's an, the absence of God for eternity and you can choose to turn your back on God's offer of salvation but God created us for relationship. He created us for relationship with himself, and he created us for relationship with each other. And you don't want to miss out on the, on the opportunity to know him and to follow him. The Bible tells us we need to take warning. Those five areas, support, inspiration, empowering, 
accountability and warning are ways that we can encourage one another. And let me end with one final verse, Hebrews 3, 13. I don't know if you can see it on the, on the overhead, but it says this, Encourage one another daily, as long as, as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. It seems to me that if we don't take time to encourage others, at least from this verse, we're going to become hardened. We're going to become, um, sin's going to take root, and we're going to be self-deceived by this sin. And you know, the people in Jesus' day were already wondering, when is Jesus going to come back? And they were starting to lose their, their zeal and their fervor. Now it's been 2,000 years, and we're still waiting. And some believe that these are the final days of the earth, and that could be. That's a common sentiment. And I don't know if, if Jesus is going to come soon or if he's going to come in another 2,000 years. But regardless of how little or much time we have, we need to keep encouraging one another. The fact that Jesus had not returned was weakening, weakening the resolve of these Hebrew Christians. And it can do the same with us if we don't encourage. If we don't encourage daily so that we can support and, and help one another. And encouragement cannot help happen in isolation. We need the body. We need the church. Why bother? Because we need each other for encouragement, for support, for help. We need each other to fulfill the mission that God has given us to build his kingdom. You know, it's, it's much easier to criticize. It's much more natural to find fault. It's, it's much more normal for me to see what's wrong with somebody. I get that. Like Al said yesterday, you don't, we don't wake up in the morning and think, how can I die to myself today? I just would love to do that. It's, it's difficult for us. We have selfish, sinful natures, but we can learn to encourage. We can learn to focus on others when we understand what Jesus did for us and the grace that he's given us. After my mom died, a bunch of people came to me and told me ways that she had been an encouragement to them. Things that I didn't know about, Sunday school teaching and camp work and all kinds of things that I never knew about. And my mom was one of those people that even if you went there to try to encourage her, you always came away more blessed than, than when you went. She was one of those people that you always felt better after you'd spent some time with. And my mom was not a smart person. She only had a grade 8 education. She couldn't spell worth beans. Like, I remember as a kid, we would have to rewrite her letters because you couldn't, she just spelled phonetically and she, no one else would understand it. And we would write her letters out for her so she could send them off. And she was not a fancy or a flashy person. But she could encourage. She made a difference in people's lives. You can do that as well. Anyone can do it. If she can do it, you can do it. You just have to choose to do it. Why bother to be part of a church, a conference, a Christian community? Because you need encouragement and you need to give encouragement. You and I can make a difference. Let us live out the word of God. Let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dale. I'll call on the choir and instruments to come up, uh, make your way up here to, to do response and singing. They will, the choir will sing one song and then we'll sing one song together in closing. While we do that, just uh, you may have missed uh, the offering bag. Maybe you forgot that there was an offering and you said, oh, I have it in my truck. Um, there will be donation boxes at the tables uh, for lunch. And so if, you, if the offering bag went by while you, you missed it or you forgot about it, um, here's another opportunity where you can give the projects. The three projects remain the same. Um, so if you give into that box, it's the same as if you were to put it into the offering bag that went by you. So if you feel led, and maybe not all of the things that uh, Abe Giesbrecht uh, mentioned resonated with you, but maybe some of you saw computers, maybe some of you saw an opportunity to, uh, to help somebody going to the mission field. Some of you will have seen different things, and so as the Lord touches you, that you, that you would give according to as the Spirit leads. And so they will uh, lead us in some singing. And then we'll have closing remarks, and then it's lunch. Okay, I would like to invite those of you that are familiar with the song, Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. Or if you're a very fluent note reader, you may come and join the choir. In the back there is tenor, that back corner there is bass, sopranos here, and altos. 
So please come up. Like I have lots of copies if you're familiar with that song. Thank you once again, choir and uh, orchestra, for playing and being willing to play with uh, instruments and uh, singing for us this morning. Uh, I'll call on Pastor Alan Kaler to come and do uh, say grace with us. Pastor Alan, we know him from uh, many years of service as pastor and uh, 
He was formerly a conference pastor. The general council has once again approved that we are going to hire Alan Kaler to be a conference pastor 50% time. And so he is going to lead us in uh, table grace in just a, a minute. But uh, they, the cooks tell us that there will be one table back there for kids. So one table for kids, one table for seniors, and uh, two tables for those of us that fall in between there. And Brangus Joe is going to make sure everybody knows where to go. And so, Brother, uh, Brother Allen, could you? A lot could be said after a day like this, but only one thing can be done, and that is to give praise back to God. Our words will never be enough, but when we go from here, our actions and our gratitude will show that we have been, not in Spanish lookout, we have been with Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you. God, we know how inadequate our words often are, yet you have given us that as well. We have heard a speaker today that challenged us to be encouraging. We have heard music that comes from, from heaven, Father. And we thank you that we have done this and seen this with hearts that have been focused and changed to see you, not ourselves or the things we do or our failures, but to live in the grace of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the cross. And because of the cross today, we are gathered here. Because of the cross today, there are men and women cooking food. Because of the cross, there are those children that are being taught in another place. And because of the cross, Father, we've been drawn back to attention to the mission of the conference, to the mission of our churches. And we thank you, Jesus, for the many ways in which we have recognized your face today and in this weekend. And so, God, as we go about our afternoon and our food and the things that you've blessed us with, the, rich, the, the wealth of this country and the countries that we come from and the freedom, may we enjoy the food and the fellowship of each other with exuberance, Father, living it to the fullest because of who you are and because of what you have done. We love you, Jesus, and we enjoy the fellowship, and we thank you. Thank you for the food and the hospitality that is put behind each ounce that we eat today. Would you bless us, Father, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, and prepare us for when you come again. We give you together, Father, we give you thanks. Let's say together, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Allen. And so uh, lunch will be ready right there. And after lunch, there will be activities for the kids. Uh, Alexander and Leah Perez are going to uh, run that program, and there's going to be activities for youth and adults, I understand, at 2 o'clock, so you will be told what happens and when, and so the uh, rest of the time will be fellowship and activities. God bless you.